scriptures talk about a blessedness that happens to a man whose delight is in the law of God. So as someone says, it says, but his delight is in the law of God. And doth he meditate day and night. He says that that man is like a tree planted by the rivers of water, whose leaves do not wither, when he bears fruit in every season. As you are about listening to this message, we believe that your life is going to be like that man planted by the rivers of water. Your leaves are forever going to bear. And we know that your, your season will not pass by. You will forever shine and you will forever bear fruit. We have a lot of content to share with you. So we would entreat you to subscribe to this channel as well as like us. Hit that notification bell to receive more updates from us because we know that whatever content here is going to set you on calls at every time. It's going to make you attain whatever stature that Christ wants you to attain. Thank you. Throughout the endless ages, you will be crowned with praises, Lord. Most high, exalted in every nation, the sovereign of all creation, Lord. Be magnified. Hallelujah. Father, as a family of faith, we choose to say thank you for the marvelous and awe-inspiring things that you continue to do in our midst. Indeed, no man can do these things except God be with him. And Lord, we thank you for being in our midst. We choose to be grateful. We choose to be discerning. We choose to see the things that you are doing. And Lord, we join the nations from end to end to say thank you thank you thank you for the miracles thank you for the signs the wonders thank you for the healings thank you for transformation thank you for salvation we bless you and tonight we have come to learn we have come to be built we have come to be established in righteousness we pray that our hearts be opened and we pray that your holy spirit and indeed, your word will prevail over our minds and our lives. Change us, O oh God, and let us go from glory to glory. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. God bless you. Please be seated. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Very touched and very humbled hearing the testimonies. You would think that because... These realities, uh, you know, every day I receive testimonies from people literally around the world just sharing the marvelous workings of the Spirit through the Word and through this ministry. And you would think that having um, gone through this routine for a very long time, you would think there would be no more excitement. But I tell you sincerely, for every time... I hear and get to see the wonder-working power of God through this ministry across the globe. I am humbled afresh. You must maintain that attitude of excitement. You must maintain that attitude that celebrates the slightest manifestation of the hand of God. For as long as no man can do it by his strength, we owe God thanks and forever. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Let me tell you something. Please listen to me. I give you a guarantee by the Spirit of the living God. If you pay attention to the things that you are learning, week in, week out, if you make up your mind as a determination to submit yourself to these doctrines and this truth, I give you a guarantee based on the integrity of the word of God. You will never live an ordinary life. Believe me. Believe me. 
The responsibility is on you to be determined. It is not something you don't get determined when you come to church. You make up your mind. God giving you the grace that I will submit to these truths. I'm not going to come and argue. I'm not going to come and try to tamper with these spiritual equations. I am childlike enough to receive with meekness, like the Bible says, the engrafted word. The Bible says that the word of Christ should dwell in you in all wisdom. We're not going to become great just by wishing. We're not going to be able to do so much for the kingdom just by blind desire. It takes more than that. There is a pathway according to Jeremiah chapter 6 and verse 16. The Bible says to stand in the way. That ancient path, it says to ask for the old path. Where is the good way? And then it says to walk therein and you shall find rest for your souls. So every time I come here for Koinonia, whether it's here in Abuja or any, anywhere at all, I am, I am, I come with a determination and I come with a safe assumption that everyone who would be under the influence of my voice would have made up their minds to receive, not just hear, hearing and receiving are two different things. Make up your mind to not just be a hearer. Oh, I'm writing, I'm writing. Be determined. A student's kind of determination. I am receiving truth that is consistent with scripture. Backed up by the presence and the power of the Holy Spirit. First to help me know the Lord and love him more. Listen carefully. This is the protocol. Number one in order of priority is that my assignment here is to fuel your desire for the things of God. That is my primary assignment in order of priority. That you should never be part of this vision and not love Jesus and not be passionate about the things of God. So your heart and your commitment and your fire, number one. Number two, that you are able to understand the systemic character of God, the structure of the kingdom. That nothing just happens. And then to submit yourself to the truths that make for transformation. Transformation. Metamorphosis. You are moving from one state to the other. Superior versions of yourself. So that the version of you that came is not the version that remains. You should never be the same person who came to church and then you return back as the same person. No, no. Nobody meets with the word of God sincerely and returns back the same. No, you should return wiser. You should return better. You should return with a greater sense of illumination. John 1, 5. And the light shineth in darkness and the darkness comprehended it not. So, I want you to make up your mind. If you are yet to do so, make up your mind, inspired by the Spirit and this charge that every time I come for koinonia or every time I invite people to join me, that includes those who are following from around the world, make up your mind to be a student. Submit yourself to knowledge. Submit yourself to doctrine. Submit yourselves to truth. Be malleable enough to allow the word of God come, not just to inform you, not just to be an addition upon the negative templates that may have been in your mind. You must submit to the word of God. There are things you will hear that are a reminder. There are things you will hear that are a new spiritual information. There are things you will hear that is a tool for deliverance, largely deliverance through transformation. Now, we come from different cultures. We come from different, um, you know, we've gone through different experiences. And when God brings this convergence, listen very carefully, you must submit yourself to learn as though you do not know anything. This arrival mentality is why many people do not receive from the Lord. Are we together? So when you come before the rabbi, 
The rabbi being the spirit of God, not just the vessel he's using, the spirit of God. You must be intentional. See the value. Listen carefully. See the value behind the truths that you learn. That every spiritual truth, every spiritual principle you learn has value to your destiny. All wise. Not just material value. That is the least. The peace and satisfaction that comes to you knowing that you are walking in dominion. Ignorance is dangerous. It keeps you in fear. It keeps you in doubt. The Bible calls knowledge and wisdom stabilizers. It says they shall be the stability of your times. Hallelujah. Every time the word of God is about to come, beware of the following. Number one, distraction. Because Satan wants to fight you from receiving the word. You can be in a meeting and not really be there. Distracted by all kinds of things. Whether it's your electronic device or whatever it is. Let your mind, your spirit, your soul, your body be there with a determination to learn. Hallelujah. Yes. Number two, familiarity. You have to be careful. Never get to a point where, oh, you think I know. John chapter 3 verse, then you help the preacher say 16. You will be surprised that it is 16, but you will never learn anything. Hallelujah. Yeah. Approach the word of God with the passion of a child. Jesus was speaking about the kingdom and he said, let the little children come to me. He says, do not forbid them for, for such. That means it will take that, that level, that attitude, being childlike to receive the things of the kingdom. As for me, I remain committed under God to make sure that every opportunity God grants, that I do not waste your time shadow boxing. It is my commitment under God to ensure that every time we are gathered like this, you are exposed to sound doctrine that is consistent with the template given by the apostles, consistent with the recommendations of scripture, cut across several divides to the end that will be built and established holistically. The key word, holistically. Lopsided spiritual growth will end us in all kinds of imbalances like we see across the body of Christ. I will never be the kind of preacher who will come to teach you on spirituality and your passion for God and your love for God and ignore the need for you to rise to a position of kingdom influence where your voice be heard and that you are relevant as far as kingdom come is concerned. God, according to scripture, is mindful of every aspect and every dimension of our lives, cutting across mental transformation, fire and passion for spiritual things, the supernatural finances, peace, all wise. And this we will do as God grants grace. My path is to remain committed. Your path is to remain intentional about reception. So whether you're in the main auditorium or any of the overflows outside or following from across, you know, make up your mind. Every opportunity you have to listen to the truths that come from this altar, be determined to receive them as the words of God to you through a man. Are we in agreement? So one more time, I'd like you to pray tonight and ask the Lord for illumination. The light shineth in darkness. Go ahead and pray. Our destinies are at the mercy of the truths that we know. Is someone praying? Go ahead and pray. You are praying for yourself, but you are also praying for the destinies connected to you. There are destinies depending on your understanding, depending on your level of enlightenment, depending on your level of spiritual illumination. For their sake, pray. Pray for understanding. Pray that the anointing that backs the word of God will fall upon you whilst the word of God is taught. Every dimension of spiritual truth has an engracing that follows it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Many years ago I had a vision. You've heard me talk again and again about this vision. 
in this vision, I was caught up in the realm of the spirit and I saw this giant door, sort of very ancient door, looked like this ancient city gate. And the Holy Spirit just zoomed that vision closer to me. And I found out that that giant gate or door was made up of smaller doors, smaller doors. Just like if you have an idea of how the post office used to be, you know those boxes? Yes, so that was how it was. And it was opening and closing, opening and closing. And every time it opened, I saw light coming out of it. Then it would close, then open again. And as I came closer, I found out that on every one of those smaller doors, there was a scripture written. That was when the Lord taught me that every revelation of truth in scripture has the grace and the anointing that backs it. That means if you claim to have caught a dimension of spiritual truth and you do not have the anointing and the engracing to validate it here and now, it may not yet be a revelation to you. Because for every revelation of God's word that you have that becomes spirit and life to you, there is an anointing that is back of that revelation that compels you to produce results consistent with the truths you have learned. I have taught us here that the assignment of the anointing is to validate the speakings of God. If God does not say anything, the anointing has no ministry. Please understand this. The anointing does not work outside of the word. Here is the balance between the age-long error that has ex existed, especially among Pentecostals and Charismatics. There are a group of people who choose the anointing and ignore the word, and there are a group of people who choose the word and ignore the anointing. Never has there been such a dichotomy according to Scripture. They walk hand in hand. The anointing only begins its operation after the word of God has been sent forth. The anointing is the validator of the word. That means if God says be lifted, the anointing, the engracing that insists that in spite of all odds you remain lifted comes into motion. The anointing is always there, but it has no assignment for as long as the word of God has not come forth. Are we together now? So in order of priority, the word of God precedes the anointing. The Bible never says in the beginning there was anointing. It never says in the beginning there was power. It says in the beginning was the word. John 1.1. 1, 1. And the word was with God and the word was God. Jesus Christ called himself the Christ of God. But then his primary name is the word of God. Are we together? Amen. So tonight... I'm here again as a faithful spiritual chef to serve us a menu in the spirit that makes for nourishment, that makes for growth. According to Jeremiah chapter 3 and verse 15, it says, and I will give you pastors or shepherds according to my heart, which will feed you. So every man of God, according to scripture, is a spiritual chef and the assignment of this spiritual chef is to make sure you combine the ingredients accordingly. You don't cook in the presence of the people. You prepare the meal. And when they come, you never call the people until the feast is ready, according to scripture. Is that true? And so when all things are ready, then you go to the byways and the highways and you compel the people to come. This may be an encouragement for a man of God here probably. It is important that we sustain the grace to be diligent. Ministry is serious business. Just because we have advantages like the anointing, the spirit of wisdom, it does not mean that we ignore or negate the need to be students, to study, to be diligent, to be sound in doctrine. Here's how the Bible puts it. It says, study to show yourself approved unto God, a workman, that needs not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. So if you're in ministry here or God is calling you into ministry, realize that beyond titles, 
beyond whatever ministerial office, you are mandated by God. Every man of God, every man of God who participates in the ministry of building men must be a teacher. I repeat, every man of God who participates in the ministry of building men must be a teacher. The teaching ministry is the exclusive platform that makes for the growth and the maturity of the saints. And if for any reason that man of God is not a teacher, you must unashamedly outsource a sound teaching ministry that becomes the pillar for growth and development. Are we together? Amen. Tonight, I am teaching on a subject that I believe would bless us all. The house of God. Please write it down. We're exploring by the spirit what the church is, the ecclesia, the house of God. Every Sunday, every Wednesday, Tuesday, or every other day, especially in Africa, we have people moving from their homes to Christian religious places of worship. And on average, most believers will tell you, I am going to church. Is that true? Where are you? They say, I am in church. And the word church has been seldom understood by many believers. And um, we've had preachers here and there try to bring illumination to the subject of the house of God and the church. It is my responsibility under God and my joy to enlighten us according to scripture, to understand in addition to the truths that we have learned and we continue to learn, to understand what exactly is the church. The goal for this teaching is to bring us to superior spiritual knowledge as to the implication of being in and being part of the house of God. Are we blessed? Genesis 28. Let's start from there for a reference. Genesis 28. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Let's begin our reading from verse 10. This is a scripture about Jacob and his encounter with the God of heaven, the first encounter. He had two principal encounters. The first was in 28, chapter 28. The second was in chapter 22, having been in Laban's house for over 20 years. Now the Bible says, Jacob went out from Beersheba and went towards Haran. Uh -huh. And he lighted upon a certain place and tarried there all night because the sun was set. The Bible says, and he took the stones of that place and put them for his pillows. Now, I don't know how he slept on stones. And lay down in that place to sleep. And the Bible says, he dreamed. And behold, a ladder set up on the earth, and the top of it reached to heaven. And behold, the angels of God ascending and descending on it. Follow the dream carefully, 13. And behold, the Lord stood above it and said, I am the Lord God of Abraham, thy father, and the God of Isaac. At this point, there was no God of Jacob. The land whereon thou liest, to thee I will give it and to thy seed. Uh -huh. And thy seed shall be as the dust of the earth, and thou shalt spread abroad to the west, to the east, to the north, to the south, and in thee and in thy seed shall all the families of the earth be blessed. Next verse. And behold, I am with thee, and will keep thee in all places whither thou goest, and I will bring thee again into this land, for I will not leave thee until I have done that which I have spoken to you of. This is a good place for someone to say amen. amen. That God is saying, I will not leave you until I do to you everything I said I would do. Amen. 16. Jacob awaked out of his sleep and said, Surely the Lord is in this place, and I knew it not. Right? So we see lack of discernment here. 17. He was afraid and said, 
how dreadful is this place? Here was his conclusion. This is none other but the house of God and this is the gate of heaven. In other words, this kind of experience based on what my father taught me, if such an experience should happen where you have the innumerable company of angels, is that true? Where you have God himself speaking to edify, to reveal his promises, to show you his ways and to assure you of his presence. He says this is none other. There is no other environment that can capture this kind of encounter except the house of God. Hallelujah. This is very powerful. Next scripture, Matthew chapter 16. The first biblical mention of the word church. From verse 13, Matthew 16 and verse 13. Jesus was with the disciples and the Bible says he came into the coast of Caesarea Philippi and he asked the disciples, so, the revelation of the church according to Jesus began with a question. What is the question? Who do men say that I, the son of man, am? His identity as the son of man. And they said, some say that thou art John, the Baptist. Some say Elias, Elijah now. Some say Jeremiah. Some say you are one of the prophets. And then 15, he said unto them, But whom say ye that I am? That means these people are giving their propositions because they are far. They are not close. They have not had the privilege of proximity. Now that you have been with me, we've eaten together, we've gone for crusades together, what is your conclusion about me? And Jesus Christ was amazed that none of them could speak. All of those multitudes, the 72, the 12, now they stood and they were completely in limbo, not knowing what to say in response to that question. 16. And Simon Peter answered and said, Thou art the Christ. Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. 17. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Blessed art thou, Simon, son of Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed it unto you, but my Father which is in heaven. Now he makes a very strong statement, and I say unto you, Thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Please keep that scripture there. It says you are Peter. And upon this rock, now I'm not here to bring up theological debates. Many people have said the rock is Peter. Many people have said the rock. No, 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 no. It's very clear from scripture. It says you are Peter. And upon this rock, what rock? Upon this revelation, upon this understanding you have had that I am Christ, the son of the living God. Are we together now? Yes. Upon this revelation, I will build my church. And if allowed to be built by me, it will be so formidable that the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Are we still together? So Jesus here is speaking about the church. He made mention of the fact that more than just dying for the sins of the world, that he came to inaugurate an institution. He came to inaugurate a phenomenon, if I would call it, called the church. And he said that this entity will be so formidable. Listen carefully. It will be the entity that sustains the power to triumph and prevail over the gates of hell. The idea of church did not start with the founders of ministries. The idea of church did not start 
with some of our patriarchs alive and dead, the idea of church was not just a government initiative to have an institution that supports activities um, that relate to faith and spirituality. No. The idea of church was God's own invention. It was a product of God's own intelligence. Listen very carefully. Because many believers view church as several things. For others, they believe that church represents a building that has some level of excellence connected to it where believers come together and then they have the opportunity to worship God. Others believe that church refers to individuals. Others believe that church refers to any platform that carries a semblance of spirituality or any platform that seems to have loyalty to the tenets of the Christian faith. So my question tonight very briefly is what is the church? I'm going to be giving you three dimensions of the church in our discussion tonight. What exactly is the church? Because if you do not know what the church is, you will embrace any definition that the devil gives you about the church. The reason why many people do not respect the church is because they do not even understand what it is. It is a very mysterious entity that the government cannot define. It is a mysterious entity that academicians cannot define. It was not a product of a research from an institution. The church came from the mind of the fountain of wisdom himself. So journey with me as we explore three definitions which represent three dimensions to our understanding of the church. Number one, the first revelation of the church according to scripture is found in Jeremiah chapter 51 from verse 20. Please give it to us. Jeremiah chapter 51 from verse 20. It says, Thou art my battle axe and my weapons of war, for with thee I will break in pieces the nations, and with thee I will destroy kingdoms. Uh-huh. It says, and with thee I will break in pieces the horse and his rider. And with thee I will break in pieces the chariot and his rider. And with thee I will break in pieces man and woman. With thee I will break in pieces old and young. With thee I will break in pieces young man and the maid. Last verse. I will also break in pieces with thee the shepherd and his flock. And with thee I will break in pieces the husbandman and his yoke of oxen. With thee I will break in pieces captains and ruler. Is there any class of society that was missing here? None. You are my battle axe. I am using you. So the first definition of the church, write it down please, that the church is a spiritual strategy. More than a people, the first revelation of the church that I want you to have is the church as a spiritual strategy, an invention from God's intelligence, a spiritual strategy, listen to me, mandated to be used by God as the only tool that is able to purge, to cleanse, to build, and to reveal Christ and his purposes in its fullness. This is the church. The church is a strategy. For instance, if, um, if I have a flat tire or I have a, pro a problem with my car and I'm unable to move it, I can hire another car that will help to drag it to a place where it will be fixed. And a strategy is usually invented where I can connect. Is that true? and connect with a moving car that is alive, a towing van, and then connect to the vehicle, and the towing van pushes it. That, that is a strategy to remedy for something. The fact that the church came into being is already proof that there was something that was not correct. Are we together now? So the church has come as a spiritual strategy to remedy a condition, to remedy a situation. There are names that we are called in scripture. One of it is light, another is salt. 
Jesus Christ himself called us light and salt. That immediately suggests that for us to be called light means there is darkness. For us to be called salt means there is a level of tastelessness somewhere and lack of preservation. So the church is a spiritual strategy. The church, in fact, is the only spiritual strategy that sustains the ability to reveal Christ in his fullness and to bring him glory. Please write it down. The only spiritual strategy that has the capacity to reveal Christ, to subdue principalities and powers. Oh, this is powerful. Thou art my battle axe. That means wherever there is darkness, wherever there is confusion, listen carefully, wherever there is lack of growth and enlightenment, wherever the purposes of God have not been made institutional within any territory, it is a reflection that the church may not be there or the church may not be shining as light. The church is a strategy. So do not ask why you are put in the midst of darkness. You are a strategy. God's strategy. Are we together? For every car that you buy, usually you would have a few tools in that car. Is that true? Most people would have a toolbox containing screwdrivers and, and, and um, you know, and um, spanners and all of those things. You would have an extra tire somewhere in the car and you would have a jack, you know, to help you if you have a flat tire. All of those things are tools and they are strategies to make sure that for no reason do you stop moving forward if you need to. So when you have a flat tire, what do you do? You go to the back of that car and open up the toolbox and you begin to effectively use the tools that will help maybe replacement. There are times that you can bring out an extra tire that helps to move the car. There are times that you can bring out all kinds of tools. That is how you are. That means whenever there is darkness, God pulls out from his toolbox and brings someone out. The church is a spiritual strategy. Wow. I am not just a man of God. I am a strategy. Do you know what that means? I am a strategy, a tool to be able to achieve something very divine, achieve something very exact as far as the revelation of the Christ is concerned. That immediately cures you from this sense of complex and inferiority. You did not just happen across the surface of the earth. You were a strategy. A strategy takes time to bring forth. Many of you are mathematicians. If you are, you are trying to solve a problem, you sit down, you think, scientists will come up with all kinds of hypotheses and go through all kinds of verification systems until it becomes a theory. You are the final decision of the intelligence of God. Did you hear what I said? Your, your arrival, the church as a strategy, means you are the final decision of a conclusion. The parliament of heaven sat down and thought of how the purposes of God will remain and you were the conclusion of that meeting. The church is a spiritual strategy. The only strategy that sustains the ability to make kingdom come a reality. Is God speaking to anyone? Hmm. So, when you know this, you do not begin to frown at the church every time you see the church involved in issues that represent darkness. If it is true that the church is a strategy, it means that strategy should find expression in politics, in government. In business, am I right? He said, I will break in pieces. And he began to list different people. Men were captured in that experience. Women, maids, rulers, princes, captains, everyone. So, the cure for the political decadence in Africa generally is the church. The cure for the economic problems of men 
This is the reason why when you say the church has no business in empowering men, you are already, it is, it is um, what do we call it now? You are insulting the very definition of the church. Wherever there is darkness is exactly where we are invited. Is someone learning now? Yeah. Can I tell you the truth? If everybody becomes a preacher called into the fivefold ministry, the church will die. Because that was not, the Bible says some, he gave some. So the proposition that everybody should become a man of God like to preach as the way to bring kingdom come is a very sincere but inaccurate understanding. The pulpit is the platform that shapes the understanding of the people like I'm doing. But the real place of assignment is not the pulpit. The real place of assignment is wherever there is darkness. Help me list a few places that you know in our world today where there is darkness. In one word or two words, everywhere. Am I right on that? Someone say everywhere. Does that include the government? Does that include schools? Does that include our banking system? Everywhere. So how relevant is the church? Are you sure the church should be relevant in activities of finances? Are you sure the church should be relevant in politics and governance? Are you sure the church should be relevant in handling demons and principalities and powers? No other strategy sustains the power to do that. Listen, can I be honest with you? Based on scripture and based on history, almost, and I'm, I'm saying this as an opinion, which is grounded on scripture, almost every other religion and institution that I know do not have the power to cast out demons. What happens is called occultic pacifism. Pacifism is an act of appeasal. It was an ancient ritual that was used to appease demons. That means when a spirit comes and is troubling an individual through some um, activity of necromancy and all of that, you conjure the spirit to ask you what it wants. And the spirit can say, I am hungry. You are eating and I have not eaten. And you ask, what do you want? He said, bring one goat. We, you see it happen in our cultures. Bring one goat. Bring one chicken. Make sure it's black. And so based on what the spirit is asking for, you politely and laboriously go and look for what it's looking for. And then it will seem to pacify itself. You will see that the individual will have a semblance of healing. Then you continue making progress and the spirit will come again. In ancient times, Old Testament particularly, when they found people who were demonized, they were usually stoned to death. Because since they did not have the ability, except for a few people who were involved in casting out demons. And the art of deliverance or, or casting out demons was not something that was really understood, you see from scripture. So, when Jesus showed up, as a model of the church and there were demonic people instead of killing the people he could neatly with surgical precision separate the influence from the individual and when they saw this they said no you are using Beelzebub the prince of demons you have found a way of rising in the realm of the spirit to negotiate your way with this prince of demons. You are just manipulating us. And Jesus said, no. If I cast it by Beelzebub, by who do your own fathers? Because many of them entered into covenants and fraternity with demon spirits. Now look up, please. Listen. Most of the African cultures today have people who are mediums. Is that true? Their assignment is to be... Um, the mediators between the spirit entities that control those territories. We have all kinds of names, but they are all the same. So, when a land seems to be barren, listen carefully, when a land seems to not produce optimally, or when there is war and people are dying, or there's a plague or pandemic of some sort, usually, this individuals who can be priests or mediums or whatever they are they are mandated to go through divination and all kinds of satanic operation to now ask those spirits what is wrong is that true and to do that they have to use divination 
and conjure the spirits. Should I teach this now? But listen, listen. The only way you move spirits from one safe location according to them to another safe location is to simulate the habitation of that spirit. Let me give you an instance. Now, we will never glorify the devil in the name of Jesus. But say I were not a believer and say I'm some idol worshiper in the village somewhere. If I want to call a spirit from wherever it is to a festival that is happening, do you know what I need to do? My first assignment is to study the habitat of that spirit spiritually and then through these sacrifices i simulate the same environment of that spirit it can now live wherever it is and come right there and still feel at home this is the reason why based on that same principle god is comfortable to be in heaven and yet live in your heart because your heart is a simulation of the throne so he can stay comfortable in your heart the holy ghost has never complained living in you are we together now? Yes. What happens is when you go through that process of salvation, something really happens to your heart. It is heaven manifesting in your heart. Now on legal basis, the Holy Spirit can reside within your heart and find the same comfort that he had when he was on Jesus. Powerful mystery. Listen to me. Most of the problems in our world today are spiritual in origin. Did you know that? And then do you believe that? Please believe. Please, in the name of Jesus and in the name of wisdom, believe early. That most of the problems that a man will face in his lifetime, personally and institutionally, are largely spiritual in origin. Now, when they manifest physically, they will have political expressions. They will have economic expressions. Are we together? They will have sociological expressions, medical expressions, intellectual expressions, but largely, the same way all things came from the realm of the spirit, all troubles come from the realm of the spirit. For further study, I make reference to the book of Job. And you will learn there that nothing just happens in this realm. The book of Job, we've studied it a bit, at least chapter 1 here. Job was a sincere man who was going about his business. The Bible says he feared the Lord and eschewed evil. And then he would offer sacrifices in advance for his children. Then the Bible says one day, something happened in the heavens. Is that true? Satan was in their midst and... God made a boast of Job, according to scripture. Have you considered my servant Job? And then the devil told the Lord, he said, does he serve you for nothing? Give me the permission to touch him. And you will see, paraphrasing, if he will not curse you to your face. And he said, okay, go. I give you permission to touch every other thing, but preserve his life. Sin two, there was a certain day. Everything was finished in the realm of the spirit. Let me digress a bit and challenge you. I made up my mind that nothing will be discussed in the realm of the spirit about me without my participation. <laughs> no way. I will not be a victim of the conclusion of it. No, 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 no. I am a spirit and I dwell in a body. I have the advantage of duality of realms. I have to be invited in that meeting and find out whether the conclusion there has kingdom come connected to it. You don't have to be there in a visionary experience. The word of God is a worthy messenger that can enter the realm of the spirit and represent your interest there. So when I talk of being captured in the realm of the spirit, you don't need a visionary experience. Send the word to be present in that meeting and you are sure that your interest will be defended. Mm. This is how we are represented in the realm of the spirit. We don't have to necessarily be there physically. The word of God uttered from the lips of faith can be captured in that meeting. So when there are principalities and powers sitting down and discussing your destiny, don't keep quiet and be the victim of the conclusion on a certain day. Listen, do you know the attack that was going to happen 
in the book of Esther. They used divination to find a date. It was the realm of the spirit that gave them a date to attack. They didn't just wish. So the realm of the spirit has a way of measuring the weaknesses of men. And it found that day to be the most conducive for whatever reason. It says strike on this date. It has become a principle today. As military men, most terrorists who go for war, they have priesthood that, that go along with them. They don't just hold the sword. They tie all kinds of things that represent their participation with the realm of the spirit. So if you are discussing my destiny in the realm of the spirit, even while I'm sleeping, the word of God will show up in that meeting, invited or not, provided you mention my name. Mentioning my name is the invitation. You cannot mention my name and say I'm not invited. Can I tell you, the days that we live in, if you allow things to just happen and you become the victim of the conclusion, you will see things happen in your life that will surprise you. Every time you pray, whether it is convenient or not, you are sending words like messengers to line up in the realm of the spirit. They are like spiritual immigration officers protecting your interest. Anything that does not represent what the word of God said, they have the assignment to fight it even while you are asleep. Some of you, this is why in your sleep, you see all kinds of things happen. The word of God is engaging the realm of the spirit to your advantage. Listen, if you don't believe what I'm sharing now, you are not a Christian. Believe me. Because this is how the word of God works. The word of God does not just work in this physical realm alone. No, he's been exalted above thrones, dominions, and every name that is named. Whether in this world or in the world to come. They were talking about Job. Do you think that Satan just left the presence of God and just ran to Job? He summoned demons. Now here's what will happen. On this day, Thursday, we, this man will wake up in the morning as before. But then it will be tragedy from morning till night. But now in Christ you have the advantage. Why? Because the Spirit of God. If the Holy Spirit can search the mind of God, He can search anybody's mind. Don't worry about trying to know what the devil is doing. The Holy Ghost saves you that trouble. The challenge with many people is that we are not discerning enough to know. So the Holy Ghost comes and then he tells you what to do. And you fire those scriptures. Send them to the realm of the spirit. Scriptures just enter and say, what is going on here? We are discussing his downfall based on what it is written. You shall be the head and not the tail. This is true. Believe it. Listen to me. I want you to believe what I'm teaching you. This is how we reign in this kingdom. So there are many of you now Wanting to know who is meeting against you is a waste of time. You can only respond to the ones that you know. But the word of God, complete and whole, send it in prayer. Send it through your confessions to the realm of the spirit to form a garrison around your destiny. Let me tell you this. Before Jesus died, he kept sending the word that I will die, but after three days I will resurrect. Can I tell you, if Jesus Christ did not send the word, those gates will not open. Because now being dead, he did not have a body. And according to the law of territory, once you exit this realm, it will take someone with a body to call you from that realm. You cannot enter without a body. I know that the gate said, who is this king of glory? But let me ask you a question. Who said, lift up your heads? <laughs> the 
the same way you can be sleeping and a scripture is saying touch not my anointed <laughs> see if you don't understand this you will not understand the ministry of prayer investments that you can send the word of God into 2023 you can send it into 2024 it is only you that celebrates new year the word of God does not celebrate new year there is no such thing as new year the realm of the spirit is, is a continual someone in one minute can you send words send words in one minute I am the head and not the tail in the name of Jesus above only and not beneath I decree and declare by the power of the Holy Ghost Gentiles come to my light kings to the brightness of my rising the favor of the Lord is upon my life I decree and declare no weapon that is fashioned against me shall prosper and every tongue that rises up against me it will fall in judgment don't be silent I decree and declare a thousand shall fall by my side ten thousand by my right side none shall hurt me with my eyes shall I see and behold the reward of the wicked that when men say there is a casting down I decree and declare that there is a lifting up in the name of Jesus my path is as a shining light that shines ever brighter even unto the perfect day I know whom I believe and I am persuaded that he is able to keep that which is committed unto him against that day I am above only above thrones dominions seated with Christ in the name of Jesus blessed in the morning blessed in the evening blessed in the afternoon blessed in the city favored by the spirit of the living God hallelujah listen please hear me believers you are being trained to know how to be victorious this is what you are receiving A strategy hear me I will tell you the principal way the church is used as a strategy to bring everything to the obedience of Christ do you know how in this kingdom the church executes its role as a strategy through the power of speakings words the primary tool for change for a believer is not just physical action the words especially when you are dealing with demonic forces when you are dealing with systems and structures there is now a place for intelligence and active participation but when you are dealing with the realm of the spirit it is immaterial even though it is real so the weapons of our warfare but they are mighty through God, the Bible says, to the pulling down of strongholds. It says those weapons, they are able to cast down imaginations and every high thing that exalts itself above the knowledge of Christ and to bring every thought to the obedience of Christ. Hear me? For every time you see evil and darkness happening, and you don't do anything about it and say I am helpless you are insulting your construction <laughs> many times because we have not seen the power of words in action we feel that all we do is it just to pray go and ask Daniel in Babylon ask what the parliament sought for they said please silence this man for 30 days Satan wants to act, but every time the, the, the spirits of the medics and the patients, the word from Daniel will step into the realm of the spirit and, and completely abort that process. They had to come down with an advice that was backed up by government. Silence this man from prayer just for 30 days to give us room to cause havoc. Can I tell you this? It is not lack of money 
that is making the devil prevail over your family. I told you that when it starts from the realm of the spirit, when it arises physically, it will now have an expression whether it will now diverge itself according to different areas. So when you see that everybody who has a job in your family is losing their job, everybody who has joy, joy does not seem to last in that family. The fact that you can discern it is proof that God is holding a battle axe that is refusing to rise in his hand. God is saying, I want to do something in this family. And here's what a lot of us say, well... I'm, I'm not the wealthiest person. I'm not the most educated. And we bring all those carnal and fleshly excuses. Let me tell you what to do from tonight. Step into your room. Switch from being a man to being a strategy. Lock that door and say, Father, there is something that can be done over this situation. I may not be able to physically give my brother a job. I may not be able to physically stop this plague of death. But in the name of Jesus, step into that control room and begin to send words to manipulate realities from the realm of the spirit until they become consistent with the word of God. Do you believe what I'm sharing with you? Can I tell you this? Every time you pray only in the face of danger, you are praying late. The real advantage of prayer is to go as a forerunner to your results. That means tomorrow's prayer should not be prayed tomorrow. Uh-uh, you prayed late already. Tomorrow's prayer should enter tomorrow and wait for that day. So that anything that is inconsistent with God's word is stopped immediately. Words are powerful. The Bible says he used words. He upholds all things by the word of his power. Have this mentality. You are not a nuisance to society. Listen, we keep using mundane parameters and not, not mundane because their vanity is necessarily, but that based on the superiority of what you have, we feel that the only time you are relevant is when I have money. Our world loves and celebrates and even worships money. Or sometimes we feel some level of extended intellectual qualification. So we feel I am only relevant if I can buy a car or I can buy physical things. But everyone here who is in Christ, I want you to know that you are a strategy and there is something you can do. If you cannot bring physical money to solve the problem, if you cannot use influence to partner with systems and structures to make change, you can handle the wicked spirits that work tirelessly. Let me tell you this. If God opens your eyes to see the spiritual activities, demonically speaking, that go on from morning till night over the destiny of one person who is not even a preacher, you will be afraid and it will jack you up to be serious. If a legion of spirits entered one man, a legion in one man, Satan has a dogged, a level of doggedness and resilience. If he did not leave Jesus Christ, he left him and returned back. Can I tell you, every destiny you see, I don't mean to scare you. The beauty and the glory of your destiny seems to be an invitation. Whenever Satan sees light, he goes there to find out exactly what is going on there. Let me tell you one of the ways that Satan knows that you have entered a prophetic season. Because according to the realm of the spirit and according to scripture, Satan is not omniscient. Are we together now? Mm -mm. Satan does not know all things. Satan omnipotence, omnipresence, and omniscience are three exclusive abilities that make God God. He did not even share that one with man. 
These are the three principal factors. So when we say he has made us gods, we are right. But I taught you that our dominion is shared dominion, not absolute dominion. Whoever is God is the one who can be omnipresent all places at the same time, omnipotent, all-powerful, omniscient, all-knowing. Satan is not omniscient. That means he depends on many factors for the supply of his information. One of it is angelic activities. Because every time a man steps into a prophetic season, there are heightened angelic activities responding. Do you know what those angels are doing? They are moving across the earth and compelling the human systems that must partner with prophecy to make the word of God come to pass. So the angels are busy making you to go to a Sokoro when you should not go because there is someone you need to meet there. All angelic activities. And the moment Satan discerns a heightened angelic activity around a life, around a ministry, he knows he was once in the system. So he knows prophecy is about to happen here and so he will come and try to fight you one of the ways you know i've taught you here that you are stepping into a defining moment is unusual attacks let me tell you this many most of them will make no sense this is why you need to pray waiting to understand your situation before you pray is living a defeated life the prayer language was given as an advantage, an all-purpose weapon. Is someone learning in church today? Say, I am a strategy. Yes, sir. The church is a strategy that was invented by God's intelligence. That means when you downplay the church, you are downplaying the principal strategy that sustains the ability to reveal Jesus the strategy is not the denominationalism the strategy is not the religiosity the strategy is the church in its purest and its essence are we blessed please be seated thank you number two very quickly hmm. I'm telling you someone will walk out of this place with confidence when when someone comes and says i just saw you and i felt like sharing something you will not ask an immature spiritual question no, no no i'm not a counselor you know that that strategy because you are a strategy the holy ghost will direct that person and the person tells you look nothing is working in my life i'm not able to rise i'm not able to succeed and while the person is speaking because you are an effective battle axe suddenly that anointing will begin to rise and while you want to look for apostle joshua selman's number the holy spirit to say no 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 he is the one who teaches you that you are the strategy now you do what the strategy does and you can tell him well i'm god's battle axe let's pray and the holy spirit said that's it that's your own part you pray and the person returns by the next day and says, who are you? Then many of us don't have an answer. The devil says, answer him and say, I'm a jobless young Nigerian who just gave his life to Christ and is suffering. Reject that kind of answer. If you don't have anything to say, say, I am a strategy. Strategy of what? The CCTV camera in many organizations is a strategy to ensure and insist that a level of maximum security be kept. Is that true? Yes. So the CCTV is a strategy and it functions to make sure that it captures the happenings around the vicinity to the end that all who come and go are protected. So God has made us strategies. Regardless where you find yourself, 
if you find yourself in politics, you are a strategy. That means your assignment starts when you identify what is wrong. Bad governance? Okay. In Africa, I am a strategy. Holy Spirit, there has to be a way. If you find out that economically speaking, people within a territory are not making progress, I am a strategy. And he comes to you as that strategy and says, in explaining you as a strategy, you are a kingdom financier. Walk with me and let me bless you so that you can establish amenities and give these people an opportunity to enjoy quality living. You are more than a kingdom financier. You are God's strategy to bring redemption. Moses was more than a prophet. Moses was the strategy that God used to bring an exodus of God's people. You know, as I talk like this, I remember the many visions. Let me share one of them with you. It is fresh to me today as it was many years ago. Never fades because it did not come from a human standpoint. I remember in that vision, I was in an elevated place and then I saw a whole generation of people and in that vision they were crying and saying no food and no water I knew it was not just a group of people it was a whole generation and I felt very responsible and then I was talking with those who were in front just like those seated in front I said who is the cause for this and they pointed their hands unanimously at me and said you are the reason why we're starving from lack of food and water. And I said to myself, I said, no, 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 I would not do this kind of evil against you. And then I made up my mind in that vision. I said, I am coming to rescue you. But then I remembered in that vision that it looked like some people had chased me into that place of confinement. And I was just trying to hide like Gideon. And I made up my mind with the courage of Esther. I said, if I perish, I perish. Now watch this. I opened that door. The moment I opened the door to go down, I just saw this giant looking gray bearded, gray headed man. Very old. With a bright garment. Giant man. He smiled at me and he said, give me your hands. He said, I will walk with you. Now I know it was the Holy Spirit. You see, he held my hand and he said, I will walk with you. Very small me, very insignificant me from that vision, but being held by the hands of an ancient giant. Please help those under the anointing. It never tires me to share this experience. Listen carefully. The moment that happened, we were to jump from building to building, but there were small ladders that were connecting one building to building. I was too small to take that giant leap. So he jumped to the other side of the building and was waiting for me to climb slowly through the ladder to connect. And he just placed his hand and was smiling at me. And I was back to myself. What kind of a vision is this? Now I understand. I am a strategy. You must believe that about yourself. You are not just adding to the census, the number. If you, don't, if you don't have this mindset, you will live a defeated life. You will live an angry, jealous, defeated life of failure. You must know that you count. This is more than a motivation. God is counting on you. Don't say there are many people. There is a unique assignment to you as a strategy. Watch this now. Imagine with me for a moment that those who hold the keys to the doors here, one person, have you been stranded in a meeting because one person did not do his duty? Have you seen people like that? Yeah. Imagine the crowds of people here, inside and outside, unable to access this facility simply because the man who was holding the padlock to the main gate fell asleep. And he just gets up and says, sorry, um, I've kept you people here for four hours. I really was asleep. That's how significant you can be. That means 
If you do not arise with the mindset of a strategy, if you're a man of God here, hear me. Don't say there are too many churches. No, there are those uniquely assigned to your grace. And if you fail because you think people are doing great things, if you fail, provided you are genuinely called. Most times, men of God come to me, sincerely so, and they say, Apostle, well, you are the people who are doing ministry. We are here, you know, just a joke, but then an honest joke to express that we are not making progress. And I tell them something. I said, listen, if the whole world depended on Joshua Selman to supply the spiritual nourishment, the church will fail. Fail so woefully because there are many dimensions captured in this assignment that have not been given to me. And you must be unashamed to admit, accept, and then celebrate the other investments that cut across the body. Wait for my teaching, the unity of faith. Hallelujah. Yes. Encounter with the body of Christ. So when you know this, you can encourage someone. He is playing this keyboard right now. The sound people are doing what they are doing. Everybody working to make this happen. I know that you give the credit to Joshua Selman because he's the face that you see. But behind this face, this strategy, there are other strategies that are making it happen. One more time, prophesy to yourself. Say, I am God's strategy. I think that's a better expression. Because if you say you are a strategy, um, your efficiency depends on who built you. We have fake products and we have real products. Fake products are products, but they are limited by the inexperience of those who produce them. Is that true? There is what we call original. And usually when people build an original product, they have some sort of seal of authenticity that they put on that product. I am God's strategy. If you are a politician, know this. I am God's strategy in politics. A businessman, I am God's strategy in business. You are a minister, I am God's strategy. Can I be honest with you? Every time I come for koinonia or travel for ministrations, many times um, it, it, it can be quite exhausting sometimes. But then I'm awakened by the fact that I am God's strategy privileged strategy for this meeting. When I come into a meeting and I sit down and I look at the people, I begin to get happy. Do you know why? Because all they need to do is to invite me upstage. Leave me and the devil, leave me and principalities, leave me and yokes and causes, leave me and ignorance, leave me and imbalance. I know what to do to them. Listen. Fire does not fear how many things are put on it. Mm -mm. You don't put wood and fire says it's too much. You just leave it for a while. Fire never says too much. Uh -uh. It sustains a unique ability. You can't catch it, yet everything physical submits to it. He makes his angels winds and his ministers flame. So when someone comes to me and says, Apostle, there is darkness around my life, there is spiritual ignorance, I'm losing my fire for the things of God, another word, a summary to what you have said is, I need you as God's strategy to be used by God to step in. And with all pleasure, you are welcome. May God locate you in an area where your efficiency will be without struggle. By, by this charge, let me wrap up this first part by encouraging you. Listen to me. The moment you find yourself struggling in an area is proof that the grace is not there. Don't kill yourself and say, there are people who are not ministers of the gospel like preachers. Just admit it with all honesty and look for where there is grace for you. There are people who are not called into the prophetic they have stretched themselves almost to death because they want to make sure they operate in the prophetic. There are people who are not apostles. It is not a, it is not a degradation. There are people who are, who are beautiful pastors. They are shepherds. They may not even be very effective teachers, but they are homely. They can bring everything together.
when you find yourself operating in an area how many of you have held a bunch of keys and they are all keys but you use the wrong key for a door sometimes it can even enter the hole and not be able to turn it looks exactly like the real key except that it is not I submit to you therefore that you must obtain grace from God to really know what area have I been assigned to some of you are intercessors like Anna the prophetess like Simeon the prophet find rest in that noble ministry and see it as noble as preaching before a crowd on a crusade ground there are some of you who are kingdom financiers you may never have the opportunity to minister as we are doing but God has anointed you to be the strategy that ensures that the work of the kingdom never fails don't fail in that assignment there are many kingdom financiers who left the work of kingdom financing to go to the pulpit simply because there seems to be some psychological attachment to being on the pulpit especially when you are leading and heading the ministry psychologically speaking you are generally considered if I ask you to arrange people in the kingdom according to nobility of call chances are that you will place people like us in front simply because of the supposed charismatism around our call but you may be wrong it will take God to arrange people according do you know the more God hides you the more you are nobler look at it in the building of the human body there are parts that you cannot see imagine if your heart was on your head you would die when an angry person comes near you he will hold that heart and squeeze it till you die so God kept it and covered it with bones now you ignore the heart simply because it's not the hands and the fingers you are seeing when your heart fails let every other thing be alive you will still die correct so I'm teaching you as kingdom people that the more you are exposed doesn't mean you are not noble every call is a high calling but let me tell you when God intentionally hides you and makes you to play a background role just know that he's protecting you jealously it is a sign that you are truly noble some of the people who pray for me as a ministry you may never see them they may never come on this pulpit I met with a group of women um, a few weeks ago while I traveled to a particular region and I was told that these women very about seven or so of them very very you know um, marvelously helped by God accomplished women and they said apostle God gave us a mandate to pray for you we are your intercessors by God when I saw them I was so broken I said how what do I do to these people to let them know that I love and appreciate them now when you see Joshua Selman doing well and doing exploits you think he's just a product of his personal prayer life until the day we stand before Jesus you will see how many people's prayer provided the leverage for us to rise to this level and anybody listen let me teach you the moment you are in a position of visibility be wise enough to know that the invisible is what bets the visible are we together because our world is sensual and carnally minded chances are that you who is the one in the elevated position that is seen by everyone usually if someone wants to sow a seed now chances are that he will not give you the seed as my intercessor it's me he will bring the seed to because he believes I am the one blessing him but let me tell you when God's reward system begins to spread around he will pick you and honor you with the same gravity that he's honoring the preacher there are people because of their efficiency as God's strategy praying for men of God for instance praying for nations you will find out that God will covenant with them that their whole family must have leaders they may not be very educated but you will never lack leaders in those families it is God's covenant and his reward system I hope that one time we'll have the opportunity to to look at the subject of prophetic intercession and I'm going to be teaching you the benefits and the blessings that follow an intercessor but for now it's sufficient for you to know that you are God's battle axe next time someone looks at you 
and says you are useless a non-entity either because some physical results that they expect to be there is not there maybe like money a car a house or some some earthly parameters of defining success find solace in the fact that you are a strategy every key remains dormant until it gets to the door it was assigned to open you can hold a key for a long time and think that key is useless if that is the key that opens the restroom when you are pressed you will know how efficient that key is if that is the key to the kitchen when you are hungry you will know how efficient that key is so that god may not seem to be doing so much physically with you it does not mean you are not part of that army it does not mean it's just that we have not gotten to the page of the story where your relevance is needed keep building yourself keep waiting knowing that you are a strategy Mary, you are a strategy, but if the angel has not announced the coming of Jesus, it will look like you are just an ordinary woman. Be patient. Elizabeth, if, if John the Baptist is not yet uh, ready to come, it will look like you are just some barren woman who married a prophet. I am God's strategy. Number two. Hello. Scriptures exhort us from the book of Proverbs. It says, my son, Attend to my sins, incline thy ears to my words. Let them not depart from thy eyes and keep them in the midst of thee. As you have listened to this message, we believe that you are going to reap the blessings thereof if you attend to these words as well. That you will keep these words in the midst of your heart. That no matter the circumstance, your eyes are going to be fixed on these words and as you have been blessed we will tell you to share this message be an evangelist by sharing to others to be blessed and then subscribe to this channel for us because we have loads of videos we have loads of content that is going to make you blessed that is going to set you on course that is going to set you ablaze and don't forget to like for us thank you